Hi, this is Professor Truth. Father God has put it on my heart that it is a priority of mine to bring the world Arnold Kennedy's teaching on the exclusiveness of Israel. As we now have all entered into the tribulation period that the Bible speaks about, it is important that the truth of the scriptures be brought forward. This EOI series, or the exclusiveness of Israel, will tell you who Israel is and what the Bible is actually all about. This series will be very contradictory to the institutionalized religious system of church. Just about everything that the church teaches is wrong. In fact, all religions, including Christianity, are actually Satanism in disguise, all worshiping the devil. Remember, a good lie has a good percentage of truth in it, and those deceived do not know they are deceived. But the truth will make you free, and this EOI series, The Exclusiveness of Israel, is the truth for the end-time remnant. Please share, and I thank you. This is Professor Truth. May God bless all of you greatly. So be it. The Exclusiveness of Israel Forward In the course of our lives, we are given opportunities that are burning bushes, pointers or signposts that lead us into the ways of God. The actions we take when those opportunities arise are fundamental to our role and position in eternity. The material presented in this book is one of those opportunities. In fact, it is more than one opportunity. It is several of them. To begin with, this book is a culmination of one man's frustration with the limits of Orthodox religion. Virtually everyone who comes to the truth of the Bible does so through the churches. Sunday school, scripture union, youth camps, and fellowship are all part of the process that is the direct equivalent of kindergarten in terms of educating our spirit. But if we are going to develop further, we have to enter primary school. Here we will start to go beyond the simple concepts of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and we will start to form a picture of the Bible as a unified whole. As the picture forms in our minds, the limitations of Orthodox religion become a barrier to furthering our education. At this point, we either break away into seemingly uncharted waters or we decide it is too hard and too complicated and settle for a status quo in the church. This book is well suited to those who have reached that point of decision. It provides a structured means by which you can verify that there are good grounds for considering the churches have a limited and blinkered view of the Bible. If you take the time to check all that is written in this book, you will be making use of another opportunity. We educate our spirit by working with the Word of God. In the same way that we cannot learn arithmetic by merely reading what someone has written in a textbook, we cannot educate our spirit by reading what another man has written. In the end, we have to do some work ourselves to practice and become skillful with the new knowledge. Checking the references provided in this book and the context in which they appear is the exact equivalent of learning multiplication tables and working through the exercises in each chapter of a math book. It will provide a useful foundation for further education. High school is a place where we learn to be critical and to investigate. We do practical work in laboratories and the like. The practical work is elementary, of course, but essential and appropriate for the level of education. High school, for our spirits, consists of taking the first steps in finding what words God used in his Greek and Hebrew text and checking their meaning with the aid of an expository dictionary. This book is an initial attempt at verifying the meaning of some important words. At this point, it is important to realize that the material in this book is fundamentally correct. 
but Strong's Concordance has been used at times to determine the meaning of some words. This is a common mistake. The problem is that a concordance is not a lexicon, and it will lead you astray more often than it will assist you. Consequently, when you quote such meanings to more knowledgeable people, they are likely to prove you wrong, which will undermine your confidence and progress. However, if you remember that the material in this book is fundamentally correct, the opportunity lies in researching the topics, finding the flaws, and seeking out the details. You will be measurably better off as a result. Tertiary education for our spirits consists of coming to grips with the grammar of the Hebrew and Greek and commencing our own translations based on the grammar alone. Our postgraduate work consists of analyzing the arguments and doctrines of the church and searching for the answers to the questions raised by others. This book has ventured into all these areas and the outcome is commensurate with the author's level of expertise. The long-term opportunity is to extend your knowledge to the point where you can amend and fill out these areas yourself. In summary, this is a useful book for those who are serious about educating their spirit. It is a good starting point and, you, and if used properly, will be a goad to further study. Author's Preface To indicate the purpose of this book, we will consider the two brackets of Scripture below. One bracket appears to be general in that it includes everybody on earth, whereas the other is exclusive to Israel as God's people. Bracket 1, the one that includes everybody on earth, John 3.15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16.17, for God so loved the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Mark 16.15, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Romans 10.13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, bracket two, which is exclusive to Israel as God's people. Matthew one twenty one, for he shall save his people from their sins. Luke one seventy seven, to give the knowledge of salvation unto his people. Luke one sixty eight, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Matthew fifteen twenty four. I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. John 1.31, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Romans 11.26, and so all Israel shall be saved. This book is a presentation of the affirmative answer to the question, Is Israel still an exclusive people? It shows that both sets of scriptures apply to the one people. Acceptance of this affirmative answer will cause some conflict with dispensational teachings, a number of popular evangelical doctrines, and the status quo of some common church teachings. The religious establishment might be displeased, but there are things for which the establishment has no answer. It will be seen that there are plain statements in the New Testament that are usually glossed over and simply not believed. Acceptance of the affirmative answer will eliminate some present conflicts in doctrine, and this is totally desirable. As soon as a subject like this is raised, there are immediate questions about the present identity of Israel. But before we can make this clear, it is absolutely necessary to establish right doctrine before we can deal with identity. Either it is right that God made exclusive covenants with Israel as a race, or he did not. The answer to this one question determines what we must believe about the New Testament doctrine, current world events, and end-of-age teachings. No disparagement of non-Israel races. Let it be clearly understood from the beginning that in saying Israel is still exclusive as a race, 
in covenant terms, there is no implied disparagement of all the other non-Israel races. Race is a fact of life, and it is also an insistent Bible fact that cannot be denied throughout both Testaments. But the Bible is primarily a book about the people of the book, Israel. Israel is declared to be a servant race, not a better race than others. Israel is presented in Scripture as a stiff-necked, rebellious people who have a responsibility given to them to demonstrate to the other races the benefits of compliance with the laws of God. One great difference between Israel and the other races is that God made a covenant between himself and Israel that he did not make with the other races. This made Israel accountable for keeping the covenant relationship. Breaking the covenant brought judgment upon Israel. It was with the same people who had the old covenant that God makes the new covenant. And this is in Hebrews 8, verse 8. If God has not recorded in the Bible his purposes for all the other races in the same way that he has done for Israel, then no one has the right to presume anything about the non-Israel races. Israel is God's chosen people by covenant relationship. Israel has a heavy accountability and burden that is not laid upon other peoples. In the Old Testament, there is a clear, consistent pattern of indisputable scripture that defined the exclusive position of Israel in relation to the other races. Few would deny this is a fact of the Old Testament. God's dealings with Israel as a people are clearly different from his dealings with the other peoples from a covenant point of view. This is found to persist throughout the New Testament. Anyone could be excused for thinking that there are efforts to hide this information, or that the present-day fact of Israel is ignored, or that biblical Israel is transferred to the Israel state. The twelve tribes of Israel are still found in the New Testament, as are references to the fathers, that is, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The letters in the New Testament are written to people who had these fathers. In the chapters to follow, this fact will be examined. As this is so, the meaning traditionally assigned to certain biblical words like Gentile, church, and a number of other words must be wrong. In the Old Testament, Israel refers to a genetic line, and despite the common teachings that Israel in the New Testament is no longer a genetic line, there is an abundance of Scripture which has consistency in presenting this genetic line. It is necessary to decide whether to believe according to the unity of the Scriptures or according to doctrines which are based on the misuse of words. The latter is the more common. So it would be well to establish a foundation by considering the much larger body of Scripture, which clearly shows the exclusive nature of national Israel among the other races. In the New Testament, the twelve tribes of Israel are still in existence, and this cannot honestly be avoided. Although an attempt is definitely made to do just that in some translations by blatant mistranslation, by paraphrasing, or by inappropriate and ina inaccurate Bible footnotes. The King James Version, also known as the Authorized Version, is used throughout this book because it is the most familiar and because Strong's Concordance is linked to it. The Foundations Used Throughout This Book It is most necessary to lay a sure foundation before making any argument for Scripture. Jesus himself and the apostles gave us a way to lay a scriptural foundation. Outside this, there is the probability of error and or a lack of certainty. It is certain that nothing can contradict this foundation. So let us look at the foundation, noting the New Testament reference back to the law and the prophets. Luke twenty four forty four, All things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms. Luke 16.31 If they hear not Moses and the prophets. Acts 15.15 15. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. Acts 17, verse 2 and 3 And Paul, as his manner was, 
went in unto them and reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. Acts twenty four fourteen, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Acts twenty six twenty two, Saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come. Isaiah eight twenty, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, It is because there is no light in them. For the Lord to say that there is no light in those who do not speak from this foundation must be taken very seriously. The contexts of the verses above are about Jesus himself and his mission. This was all prophesied. Romans 16, 25 and 26. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations of Israel. The mystery cannot be manifest without the scriptures of the prophets. Those who decry the prophets are destroying their own ability to have understanding. Throughout the New Testament, the Greek word graph is used for what is written in the Old Testament, and it is used approximately 50 times. This is a lot of times, so there is no excuse for writing or speaking from another basis. To speak other than from the law, the prophets, and the Psalms is to deceive. If the deceiving is done in ignorance, then it can be set aside through repentance and a change in direction. So we must be aware that we are dealing with a vitally important subject. For the Apostle Paul to say that he limited his teachings to those things that were based upon Moses and the prophets disallows the popular teachings that Paul had additional revelations about the church that were not contained within the Old Testament prophecies. It might be questioned whether the common basis used today is different from the basis Jesus and the apostles used. What is going to be shown is that there are popular New Testament doctrines taught throughout many of the Christian denominations which do not have this right foundation. In this book, we are not concerned primarily about doctrines concerning elementary practical Christian living on this occasion, but rather those which concern prophecy history, and end-of-age events. On the right foundation, Israel is exclusive. In the Old Testament, there is a large body of Scripture which is consistent in spelling out the exclusiveness of Israel in words that are simple and direct. From this Old Testament foundation, it is found that the exclusiveness of Israel continues into the New Testament. Without the Old Testament foundation, the connection might be missed with the consequence that the national message of the Bible and the kingdom of heaven can no longer be proclaimed. The New Testament fulfills the promises made about Jesus and his mission to Israel. Luke 24, verse 44. All things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. If we move away from the foundation of the Old Testament into the New Testament doctrine that does not have Old Testament foundations, then we must get it wrong. There are major areas of today's teaching about the New Testament that do not have the Old Testament foundations. These have the appearance of being the Word of God, and they are followed by perhaps 90% of denominations today. However, there is undeviating agreement through both testaments that will surprise many, and there are aspects that may not have been taught about previously. This is because they are never presented in most denominations. It is the simplicity of the answers which will register, but this in turn will create other questions that will arise because they will conflict with traditional beliefs. 
Yes, there will be reactions and a number of common reactions are listed with comments in a later chapter. These reactions will be common to most readers because most readers will have had the same teaching that, open quote, the Jews, close quote, are Israel. The words Jew and Gentiles are key issues in this book. We have to believe Moses to be able to believe Jesus. Jesus asks a question that every Christian today should be able to answer. Most denominations will not teach, ask, or answer this question. John 5, 46 and 47. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Then we have John 3, 12. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Luke sixteen thirty one. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. It is a simple thing to test some of the prophetic things that Moses wrote and see if these are commonly accepted by most denominations. If they are not accepted, then it is these denominations that must have a great problem in their understanding of the words of Jesus. This is saying that if we do not believe what Moses wrote, we will not be able to believe Jesus. To ignore Moses means that we cannot help misinterpreting Jesus' words. We will look at some of the writings of Moses to see if it is safe to say that the greater majority of professing Christians do not believe the writings of Moses. When these words of Moses are not believed, the words of Jesus cannot be properly understood. What this means is that the great majority of professing Christians are, of necessity, being taught things that are not the whole truth concerning Jesus' words. It might be claimed that the Holy Spirit teaches us and guides us into all truth, and that he speaks of Jesus, but the self-same Holy Spirit of truth would not encourage us to disbelieve the writings of Moses. He must want us to be guided into believing the writings of Moses in order that we might believe the words of Jesus. The matters we are going to look at do not pertain to the law and what might be or what might not be fulfilled in that law with regard to sacrifices and rituals. We are told in the Gospels about certain scriptures that are already fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus speaks about certain things that will yet be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. For example, Luke 22, verse 16. The kingdom of God is presented as being an inheritance yet to be possessed. In the book of Revelation, we are told, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Moses is called a prophet, and no one can pretend that every Old Testament prophecy and promise is already fulfilled. What we will look at throughout this book is in whom the Bible states certain things are fulfilled, or will yet be fulfilled. We will see that there is no scope for universalism. For us to believe Moses, there are some things which he tells us that are not commonly accepted. What we believe about these things conditions what we believe about the New Testament. In other words, it conditions what we believe about Jesus' words. What are some of these things that are not commonly believed in the writings of Moses? Moses wrote and made statements about the Lord God of Israel and about Israel being God's people. Moses wrote about God's special relationship with Israel as being a separate people from all the other races. As soon as this is, is accepted, it will be seen that this separation also runs through the New Testament. Moses wrote of covenants and promises made to Israel. The New Testament says that the promise which was made unto the fathers, that is, of Israel, God has fulfilled unto Israel us, their children. This is in Acts 13, verse 32 and 33. There is never a mention of fulfillment in any others. We will see that the current popular concepts about Israel and the children, or sperma, 
of Abraham are inadequate. There is a large amount of preconditioning from popular teachings to overcome, and this is never easy for anyone. Moses wrote about election in the same way that the Apostle Paul did, and both were concerned with the same one people. Moses wrote about the word of God and the law of Moses as being given only to Israel amongst all the other races. As this is so, then only Israel needed redemption from this law that Israel broke. This is why it is recorded that Jesus came to save his people, that is Israel, from their sins. Matthew 1 verse 21 and Luke 1 verse 77. Throughout both Testaments, the people concerned are always God's people before they are redeemed. To be brought back means that they must have been in God's favor once before. They can only be Israel. Moses wrote about the different destinies of each individual tribe of Israel in the last days. It is never a common destiny as the Jews in the way currently taught. He wrote of the birthright position of the sons of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh in the last days. The prophecy made by Jacob, Genesis 48, verse 19, and by Moses, Deuteronomy 33, for the last days concerning the sons of Jacob are commonly ignored. In today's teaching, they do not even rate a mention. Even if this is an important prophetic subject that has a bearing on the last days events. Moses wrote concerning Jesus in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 through 19, as confirmed in Acts 3, verse 22 and 23, we read, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Jesus was to be raised up unto Israel, ye men of Israel, as being addressed, in the same manner and to the same people. To not hear this and to extend this to include all people of every race is to become destroyed from among the people. As Jesus says, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Luke 16, verse 31. This is not and was not the belief of our popular translators, and the contrary view has thus been written into the translations. While many are prepared to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, they are not prepared to believe what Jesus said. Jesus spoke in John 6, verse 32 through 70, about what if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, making it very clear that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Verse 65. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Verse 44. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. That is, his people, the house of Israel, that Jesus redeemed. And him that cometh to me, these are the individuals in Israel who accept, believe what Jesus has done, I will in no wise cast out. Verse 37 and 39. The limitations spelled out in these verses still offend people and is still a hard saying. Who can hear it? All the religious tradition, translations, emotion, or sentiment are not going to change these limitations. Moses wrote about what Balaam prophesied of the tents of Jacob and the tabernacles of Israel in Numbers 24 and of what God's people would do to Moab Sheth, and Edom in the later days. Each of these identities are ignored today. Even if Jacob is mentioned 24 times in the New Testament, and Israel occurs 75 times in the New Testament, one never hears of the destiny of Edom. Israel, together with Jacob, occurs 3,929 times by name through the Bible. This is one reason why the Bible can be said to be a book about Israel. Moses wrote a song of which we are told in Revelation 15, verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. 
At this end time, there is no change in the context of the Song of Moses. In this song, we are told, For the Lord's portion is his people, and Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. At the end of this song, we are told, And will be merciful unto his land and to his people. Deuteronomy 32, verse 9 and 43. These words were spoken to all Israel only. The Psalms and all the prophets, together with the New Testament, consistently confirm what Moses wrote. They do not and cannot oppose each other. We either agree or reject this, but Jesus says we must believe Moses if we say we believe Jesus. If we really want to know the answer to the question that was asked in John 5, verse 46 and 47 at the start of the subsection, and hence for our assemblies to work the works of God, this is the answer Jesus gave. John 6, verse 29. Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him who he hath sent. Not believing what God says brings judgment. Over and over again through Scripture, we find that God's people simply would not believe what God said. This continued refusal brought the eventual judgment of God upon this unbelief, and this is a very serious consideration for us all. It is recorded how Abraham believed God, and there was a good consequence for doing so. Because of traditional teachings and Bible education, it is extremely difficult for Christians today to believe what God says, especially when it comes to believing the writings of Moses. We can learn a lot about faith, but if we do not learn about the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, Jude verse 3, we find a block in the practical exercising of faith. But Moses did speak of Jesus and for whom, in particular, Jesus would be raised up to save from their sins. If we believe the implication of the phrases, go into all the world and God so loved the world, as they are commonly presented, then we cannot believe Moses at the same time. These two scriptures are reevaluated in this book. Remember, once again, Jesus says we must believe him and what he says about Moses in order to believe what he is saying. It is necessary to re-examine the meaning of simple words like the Jews, Gentiles, the church, Abraham's seed, and Israel. Please do not answer a matter before it has been heard, because it is wrong to do so. Let us first build our foundation through the Old Testament and then judge this matter. In this foundation, we find statements about the law, statutes, and judgments that God gave only to his people Israel. In no way does this say that non-Israelites are not subject to a law principle, but there is a difference. Speaking to Israel specifically, we read Deuteronomy 4, verse 6 through 8. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes, and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law? Verse 13, And he declared unto you his covenant, even ten commandments. This scripture is addressed exclusively to Israel as a race of people, and it shows the relationship between Israel and the balance of races. This is what this book is about. Chapter Outlines Chapter 1 Exclusive Nature of Israel in the Old Testament Chapter 2 Exclusive Nature of Israel in the New Testament 
chapter 3, Reactions to an Exclusive Israel. Chapter 4, Which World Did God So Love? Chapter 5, Stumbling Blocks to an Exclusive Israel. Chapter 6, That Unfortunate Word, Gentile. Chapter 7, Could the Modern Jews Be Israel? Chapter 8, Galatians and Israel Exclusive. Chapter 9, Adoption. Chapter 10, Pilgrims, Strangers, and Israel. Chapter 11, Seeds, Natural and Spiritual. Chapter 12, Born Again or Begotten from Above. Chapter 13, The Church. Chapter 14, Why Not Proclaim the Kingdom of Heaven? Chapter 15, The Regathering of Israel, Old Testament. Chapter 16, The Regathering of Israel, New Testament. Chapter 17, The Heirs of Jacob, Israel. Chapter 18, The Sons of Joseph, Chapter 19, The Non-Israel Races. Chapter 20, What of Balaam's Doctrine? This concludes the introduction to The Exclusiveness of Israel by Arnold Kennedy.